Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome to Become Famous for What You Do. I am so excited. I have been, I I wouldn't say I've been stalking Maggie, but I have really, really wanted to have Maggie um, on for the show because when I was scrounging around researching for my book, she came up with this expression that I thought is so valuable for all of us that are on the internet, social media, and it's the celebrity entrepreneur. And she has a business called BS Free Business. And I just love what you have to say. Welcome, Maggie. I'm so excited to hear her, be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so tell me, how did you, because I read this article and I, I was devouring it about the celebrity entrepreneur. Tell me about how you wrote, the, how you wrote it and how did it move forward and so forth. So I was noticing, I've been in the online world for 10 years and back in 2020, I was noticing there's a, there's kind of a shift in the conversation happening. And a lot of people kept saying, well, it's and with in online business, bro marketers. And it was very like this very narrow definition of these are people who own businesses, selling you courses and masterminds and, you know, all these educational products and using these tactics that are sketchy and scammy. And I was like, wait a second, it's not bro marketer specifically. This comes in many different flavors, many different packages, because if we train people to look for a bro marketer, they're looking for a very specific archetype. So I was like, we need a better name for so What is a bro so- marketer? Because I've never heard of bro marketer. Yeah. So a bro marketer is someone I'm trying not to name names because I don't name names, but you know, think of the most prevalent internet marketers. Those are classic bro marketers. They use tactics that are very much about scarcity. Uh, They very much market their lifestyle. Uh, They try to manipulate you into purchasing. And it's really always like, Kind of just this undercurrent of negativity of like, okay, you know what? You suck because you're not making this kind of money or, you know, you're, you're playing small, you're selling yourself short. And it's this very kind of masculine approach to doing business. And I, what I saw a lot of people doing is thinking, well, it's just those guys doing it. And I was like, no, no, people of all genders do this. People of... But that package can look so different. It can look like your best friend. It can look like, you know, your favorite creative person. It doesn't matter what the the package is. It's the tactics they're using. And I want people to really get past the fact that like, it's not just these big names. It's something that's really spread in a really just kind of scary way through online business. I don't like it and and your article was it was just a breath of fresh air i i I was caught up in the celebrity entrepreneurial it's like a confession here it's like almost like i've been caught in a celebrity entrepreneurs and i you know you spend the money and you get caught you don't even realize you're getting caught in it and you get caught 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 and then you're chasing 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 and then you're getting all these emails and it just like bombards you and you're asking yourself Wait, and what I love so much, it was you and Alex Harmonzi. I don't know if I pronounce his right name, but he says, when you've got the information, take a pause, go into your own self and get the shit done. Right. And yes, and that was instead of chasing someone else's timeline and feeling like you're never making it, never making it. And then you keep throwing money and you're asking yourself, is this the right thing? And then your article came. It was fantastic. Yeah, and I think what you said, like the escalating commitments, this is a big thing. I see two, you know, kind of troubling things happening in this industry is, you know, you start off small, you might buy a small course, but what people don't realize is 
there is an entire ecosystem designed to bring you up the ladder to spend increasingly more money and more money and more money. And let's say you spent a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, and then they tell you, well, this thing's going to be, this next thing is going to be the thing. So you get into trapped in a, a phenomenon called sunk cost fallacy, where you're like, well, I've spent the thousand dollars. I might as well spend $3,000 because I'm almost there. Right. And there is no end to these things. A lot of these people start off with $7, you know, $10, $20 small info products and sell up to $100,000 masterminds. They're, they're, they're there to take your money in so many different ways. And if you aren't able to untether from that and realize like the next thing isn't going to solve the problem because the first thing didn't solve the problem. And oh, FYI, a lot of these problems aren't even real problems. They're just things they've invented pro problems so they can sell you something. So that's the kind of first thing I see a lot of. And then the other thing I see a lot of is people just really trying to, they get caught up in using these tactics they've learned from people that aren't aligned with their values, that are out of alignment with their personal ethics, and they feel really bad about it. And it can't, it just doesn't work in their business the same way, but they just keep thinking, oh, if I just do this one more thing and just like people are willing to sell out. And what's happened is because, you know, it's, it's like, it's kind of like COVID. It spreads, right? It <laughs> spreads through the, you know, the, you have this virus spreading through where people really and truly are indoctrinated into these tactics. And people think, you know, people argue with me all the time on the internet. Well, what do I do instead? I'm like, let me introduce you to a little thing called marketing. Like marketing does not have to be done in the way we see it being done by celebrity entrepreneurs or seeing it being done in these online business circles. There's a whole other world of marketing that's done, you know, with integrity and trust and transparency. And um, it's not that wild. I, you know, in another part of my life, I work with corporate clients. We do marketing in a, re in a nice, like, honest kind of way. And so we don't have to do these things in our business, even though they are very, very typical and they are the status quo. I, I think I really, really like what you said there. And how would you define the celebrity entrepreneur? Because you said it was bro marketing and you turned into this word celebrity entrepreneur. I would love for you to define that because I think getting more people like my, my podcast is about become famous, right? I want that word to become famous so that we can see those people out there and not buy from them because I think they are a problem and they put a bad name to communications, a bad name to marketing. And it's even people that I know you're absolutely right. That suddenly go into that trajectory and then they suddenly don't want to meet with you because now they're going to have this mastermind and they're going to be, it's like the fame in the wrong way. Yeah. And I think the thing that I really see with these people is it is fame in the wrong way. And it's going from fame in a way like being known as an expert for what you do to a cult of personality starting to use very, I hate to say this, very cult like tactics. And, you know, it's promising access to insider secrets. Um, there's definitely a leader follower dynamic. There's this need to constantly keep investing money and, the other thing I see a lot of is you can't question their authority. It's a marketing machine. This is the way you do things. There's no room for dialogue or debate. And if you so much as stick your neck out a little bit, it is going to get chopped off. There is um, zero ability to have any sort of feedback. There's a lot of really unhealthy dynamics going on that if we saw them in a different context, in, we saw them in a relationship, we saw them in a friendship, we would be like, Ooh, I'm not doing this. And I think something to really keep in mind here is um, Adam Grant, he talks about the difference between culture and a cult. And it always comes down to this. Do you have the freedom to question and challenge the way things are done? In a lot of these celebrity entrepreneurs, you cannot question how things are done. You absolutely cannot. It's not allowed. Or like their way is the best way. Their way is the highway. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I, and I, I, I really thought I was smart, you know, and I, I was not, I got caught up in it. I really got caught up in it. And I asked myself, how did I get caught up in it? So I think that's a really good point you bring up, though, because once we've been burned, I've been burned, too. I talk to people who have been burned all the time. It's not that we're not smart. It's that they're 
using tactics that are deliberately designed to short circuit how we think about these things. They literally do things to overwhelm us, to shut down our critical thinking, to get us to do things in a way that all that stuff goes in the back seat and we're just going on pure emotion. And so it's not a matter of being smart or savvy. It's that they're really good at what they do. And that's where a lot of the cult like parallels, they are using tactics. They're ripped. Like if you were to sit down, read a book about cults and then compare it to these tactics, you will 100% see absolutely there are parallels there. And that's because we are all vulnerable to being manipulated in this way. Yeah. I, and, and you're absolutely right. Because when I got caught in one of them, it's like I'm getting phone calls. And then not only that, what I really thought was surprising, at least this this one group that I was, is I saw that they had HubSpot as their working mechanism. Mm -hmm. And they're calling me like they don't even know me. Like, so, so interesting. I was like, like they had this, like, oh, we're so busy. Yeah. Like, and then it's like, you get, I'm getting like four or five calls. Like right now I have to block them for spam. Right. Um, it's, it's like, they're calling me uh, like they don't know me. And I called, I had like a concierge guy that's supposed to guide me through all of this stuff. And you're bombarded yeah. with these, these videos. Like what? I have 500 videos that I'm supposed to be looking through. You're getting overwhelmed. It's like, wow, I need to know all this before I, and I thought I knew communications, right? <laughs> Yeah. And, and you're, you're getting, and you're right, you're getting tread into this thing. And then you have these, these meetings. And if you don't go to the meeting, you feel like a failure. But at the same time, I need to spend time doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I called the guy and I, my concierge guy and I asked him, why in the world don't you take the time to know me? Right. Why don't you take the time to actually put me through a journey so I can win? You're almost like making it so I'm not going to win. It's very Yeah, and there's not, and I think what you said is really interesting because there's not a lot of focus on the user's needs, the customer's needs, the customer experience, the user journey, like none of that. It, it's literally like, how can we get your money and continue to get your money? Yeah. You are not... And I mean, there are people doing things that run programs that offer courses that do really, really well and with a lot of thought and a lot of care and a lot of integrity. But on the whole, in this industry, it, it's literally just a way for people to make bank. And like they do not, yeah, they do not prioritize the needs of the buyer at all. It's all about the seller's bank account. But I don't know how that can last. You know, what I think is so interesting is the way I get clients and mostly I've gotten clients through referrals. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing now a podcast. I'm going to go out and do some more marketing is I want people to get to know me, but I just pride myself in caring about my clients and, and caring about their journey and, and listening to the, where they are. And if I haven't really supplied well enough, I will go above and beyond, beyond to make them happy. I mean, I yeah, just, and I'm just really, I'm really surprised by, by the tactics. Well, there's a couple things at play. Yeah. So, so the first thing is at play, like you want to genuinely have that conversation with your clients. You want to make sure you deliver it as promised. You want to meet their expectations. A lot a lot of times what will happen in these group settings. And again, this is very course of control cult like right. tactics where if you don't get the result that has been, you know, dangled to lure you into the program, it's a you problem. It's ne there's, there's a lack of shared responsibility. It's always the responsibility comes back on you as the buyer to say, you know what? No, you didn't do X or you didn't want it bad enough or my favorite. And this happens all the time. You have a mindset problem. They turn it around on you to be like, this is a you problem. It's not my curriculum. It isn't me. And that's just an unfortunate reality. And that's why really as a consumer, you need to be able to slow down to really assess, like, is this the right fit? Like I know for me, I don't do well in large group programs where there's, it's very nameless and faceless. I need to know and be connected to the person leading that 
Right. I told you. Yeah, no, I, I was just, uh, and it was like this one mastermind I was in, they were going to promise me that I was going to make such and such amount of money. And I'm in there for four months and nothing is happening. And it's basically not even covering what I thought it would be covering. Like, and I just had to say straight out, this is, this is not what I was promised. Right. And then, and then they make you feel guilty because you made this commitment, but you didn't commit to me. You didn't give me what I needed. And then, and then like the solution was, well, I'll give you, I will be so kind and I'll give you a few hours a month to talk with you. But it's not really looking at the problem. And I'm, I was probably not the right person in the group. And I've realized that now, but it was just really, uh, I was just surprised that I got caught into it, to be honest with you. And I, maybe it's my arrogance, <laughs> but I never thought no, I, I would be caught into it. But what you said though about, it was, you know, you realize now it wasn't a fit to you, for you. When you look at these programs, when you look at these masterminds, they promise it's a fit for everybody. When yeah. And then that, to me, should be treated as a red flag. When there is a very broad, we work with service providers, course creators, mastermind leaders, accountants, doctors, lawyers, like, when it's that broad, the lack of specificity is a sign that they are taking anyone and everyone. So, you know, you've got to look at that. The other thing you have to look at is like, how are they vetting the group? Like, yeah. is the qualification, you can pay that at first payment, you have a pulse? Because that's yeah. the way a lot of these things are. Uh, and a lot of but, you know, they're getting savvier. These these tactics are always evolving. So now this is why we see like you're going to have a sales call. Well, who are you having this sales call with? I know. Is that person a salesperson, yeah. an enrollment specialist? Their job is to sell you the thing no matter what. Right. It's very rare. And that's why one of the questions I love is how many people do you say no to? Oh, the majority of them thing. act like it's this big, oh, you know, you've got to qualify to be in the group. No, no, no they're yes. taking 99.9% .9 of people. If you're just willing to pay. Exactly. That is the requirement. Are there anyone out there? I think there's one person I really, really like that does not. And he's the one I've really followed for a long time and really been a mentor that not that he's a mentor of mine that I know him, but followed and it's Michael Hyatt. Um, he is, he was called the digital virtual mentor and he uh, is very, very solid. Like I've done his program. It's never this kind of salesy thing. He just has, I have this curriculum. It's open at this and this time you can join or you cannot join. Boom. Close it off. Right. And it's just, it's just like straightforward. And then this other stuff, it's just like, I'm just flabbergasted. I'm flabbergasted that it does so well. And then the people that do get into the program and they do well with the program, they make it even worse because they're seconding and then they're saying, oh, this is so great. And that's a really interesting aspect of it because what we see, like the successes that come out of these programs, if you have a hundred people, maybe there's two people that are super successful. They then in turn become the poster children, which is what yeah. you're getting at. Yeah. And then it perpetuates this. Well, I made this. What we don't know about those people is where were they before they were in that program? What skills, what, what resources did they have? What privileges did they have? Yeah. We're not aware of those things. Right. And, and they're, is this phenomenon called survivors or those 2% of people that succeed? That's the sticky. We don't see the other 99 or 98% of failures. We don't. We only see the successes. And so when we look at something, we have to really critically from a con you know consumer point of view say, okay, so what am I not seeing here? Right. I'm seeing only testimonials that are just like, over the top. Where are the like kind of normal people? Where's the average result? Right. Yeah, no, it's very, very interesting. And more importantly, like for me, as a consumer, as a marketer, as a business owner, when I'm vetting a program, I just don't do business with people that are promising me I'm going to make X amount of money. 
because that's the ultimate clickbait. We are so vulnerable to say, I'm going to make six figures. I'm going to make seven figures. Why do you have to use that to get my attention? I would rather have you focus on something else and actually have something really solid versus this very like, make all the money promise because that's a pretty generic marketing promise. It is. So Maggie, I've written two things down that you say, uh, it, ask them how many, how many, how many have to walk away? How many do you say no to? I like that. And don't go for anything that has X amount of money. Um, how do you, and then the other one was, um, if you can't, if you can critique them, if it's right or wrong, um, that was another one. Is there any other, how do you, def, how do you else, what other things do you look for in a program? Ooh, yeah. So going back to the critique thing, and then I, there's a couple others I love to call out, but <laughs> the critique thing, yes. watch them on their social media. If you encounter someone who does not allow any sort of, even let's say on Instagram, they don't allow comments, negative comments. They don't allow debate. They shut that down immediately. That is a red flag. Absolutely. Because if they won't allow it in public, they're not going to allow it behind closed doors. Right. What someone does in public is often going to tell you what's going to happen behind closed doors. Okay. Another thing I love to look for is can you figure out where they learned from? What's their kind of family tree or their lineage? So did they learn this from internet marketer XYZ? Who are their teachers? And if someone will not willingly tell you or doesn't disclose who their teachers are, again, that to me brings up some questions. You know, it's interesting you say that because having worked behind the scenes like you, we're behind the scenes and helping other people. I always look who's behind the scenes, who's behind the scenes, right? And so yes. when I started thinking about going off on my own and working on the internet or just having my own business, I was, I stumbled upon my, Michael Hyde, which I loved. And I really liked Lewis Howes. It's this fun uh, podcaster, Tim Freeze and these guys. And then I always asked, who do they go to? And the one common thread, not that all three of them have, but the one impression I had was it was Tony Robbins. And what was interesting was uh, almost everyone has come from Tony Robbins in, in some sense of form. And it was interesting because... I then, I lived in Norway at the time. So then I went to the UK for Tony Robbins to learn. And I was like, really, I was impressed. He's got some, some programs that are really, really good. I ended up in Florida and I met the most amazing group of people, not his group, but I ended up in a smaller mastermind group. My mentor, Michelle Soro, who's like one of the top podcasters uh, globally and be got this amazing experience, never this salesy celebrity entrepreneur, just selling you in the program, giving you the next step, giving you the next step. And it was one of the, a great experience. So it's just interesting. I've noticed that a lot of them come from Tony Robbins. How do you think? Yeah, a lot of them do. They I'm, do. Not, I'm gonna res, I'm gonna reserve comment on Tony. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. But it was just fascinating. Uh, I'm not so keen on him now, like he's okay, but it was just fascinating that that's how I got into this crazy world. <laughs> and we all started somewhere, right? <laughs> and I, and I have a degree from communications, but it was just interesting. This is like a whole different world. I've not known how to communicate in that world because I work with businesses. I work with corporations on topics. So it's interesting when you get caught in this world, to ask yourself, who is actually your target audience? Who are you actually going for? Because it's not my, that's not my target audience. Usually it's companies, but it's been fascinating. Fascinating. And it's just so refreshing to talk to you about it. Yeah. And my, my background is corporate too. And I, I will yeah. always say to clients, like we're talking about two very, very different animals. It is. And that's why I always kind of laugh when people are like, I sell to corporations, but I'm in this course of like, no. Oh, don't do it. Like knowing who your end client is and your market, like again, really vetting things. So you focus very intentionally on the right things. Um, Cause online business loves to make all these pro you know, promises and they love to be like every, everyone in the kitchen sink can be in this, but that's not actually the way it, you know, the way it should be working. No. So we have got four things right now. 
find out how many no's they have, how much money, critique, and then also finding who's who are they learning from. I totally agree with you. Uh, and then what else would you say? How do you find out if they're in a cult? Well, I always like to ask around, but I mean, you know, honestly, the best piece of advice I can ever give anyone is to slow down. So, you know, it's the day, the, the cart is closing, you're, you're swept up, you are on pure emotion, pure excitement, pure dreaming of the thing they're promising you. The program will open again, even if they say it won't. You can always come back to it later. So really slow in your roll and being like, you know what? I don't need this right now. Engaging some sober second thought to slow down. Because the other part of that is so many people in this industry overspend. So having a budget for, listen, this is my education and training budget for the year. This is my plan. This is what this is going to look like. So you can like be like, pull up your spreadsheet and be like, you know what? I don't have the money for this right now versus I'm going to throw this on a credit card and hopefully I'll make the money back to pay, pay it back because so many people end, in, end up in so much debt because they are just swept away with the excitement. And we are encouraged time and time again to go into debt to buy these things because it's about, you know, take the leap. And it's like, I'm not shaming anyone who's gone into debt for this because it is super easy to do. It is normalized in this industry, but you've got to really consider like, can I set this money on fire? Am I okay with losing it? Because there is the likelihood this may not work as promised. Yeah. So Let's shift gears then, Maggie. We've, we've got our five, and I think they're really good. So how many no's do they say for the program? If they put a money on what you're going to make, then run away. Critique, can they take critic, critique, critiques on social media? How do they handle it? Do they have a common field? If they don't have a common field, let's leave them where they are. Uh, find out who their experts are, that they are. Are they willing to say who their experts are, who their mentors are? I like that a lot. And I think really the best one that you said was slow down sober second thought i love yeah. that sober second thought and and remind yourself that you're being caught up with the emotions and uh the panacea is not their program it's you actually and and i'd love to talk to you now shifting so what does someone do that's a small business that wants to get themselves out there uh what what would you, what would you recommend? Oh, that's a many layered question for me as a marketer and communication. Yeah. Yeah. Person, oh, I know. I know. I know. Appreciate I know. It. Yeah. I appreciate it. But I'm just like, uh, because you feel like you're in a jungle. Like when I, when yes. I, when I look like I'm a communications person, I'm not a marketing person. And I feel lost in the jungle of TikTok, lost in the jungle of Facebook. I'm, uh, it's just like, wow, where do you, where do you start? Where do you go? And how do you do it? Like, what's what would you say? You you know your target audience. You know kind of the basics, which we're all taught. What do you do? What do you do? What do I do? Well, yeah. Number one is you need a unique point of view. You cannot be out there saying the same thing that every single other person in your industry is saying. There is so much boring content being created in the world. We don't need more boring content. You need to have a unique point of view. And that may be based on your strengths, your values, your skills, your experiences. It it doesn't have to be revolutionary, but you do have to have a unique point of view. The other thing that I see a lot of and I impress upon the clients I do consulting for their small businesses is truly understanding where your target market hangs out. So you've got, you've got all these options, right? You've got LinkedIn, you've got Instagram, you've got podcasts, you've got YouTube. If you're working with corporate clients, like I sell in my agency, we sell to directors of marketing, typically our, our client. They're not looking for content marketing agency on TikTok. They're not. So I'm not going to use TikTok. And it's really easy to get swept away with the excitement of like, oh, it's a new platform or, oh, I could do this. But if you're, don't start a podcast if your 
potential clients don't listen to podcasts. So really, you know, digging into where are they going to actually hang out? Where are they looking for that information? How do they look for that information? And then figuring out, okay, so maybe they hang out on LinkedIn. They are Googling for this. They listen to these types of podcasts. Maybe I'm going to guest podcast. I'm going to focus on some SEO, you know, writing some blog posts. They're focused on SEO very, very specifically. And I'm going to focus in on LinkedIn, like getting, you know, narrowing that focus to where you have the best chances of getting in front of those people. The other thing that's really, really important is do not get obsessive about having to build a huge audience. You can build a very small, very niched, very loyal audience because especially if you run a service business, you don't need a hundred new clients a year, maybe you need five. So quality over quantity is so, so important. I feel people, especially if they have any exposure to the online world, they get really swept up in like, I need thousands of people. And I'm like, you don't need thousands of people. You need a hundred people to be paying attention to you. Yeah, they say something about a thousand people or something like that. Um, oh, I really, I really like it. Just sounds so down to earth what you're saying. Yeah, and honestly, as a business owner, most of people, unless you are a marketer, you didn't start a business to do marketing. Marketing is like your extra thing you're doing beyond serving your clients. So you know, doing the right marketing tactics versus all the marketing tactics, you've got to maximize the time you actually have and do, you know, small controlled things that actually get results and being willing to be like, okay, that's not the right thing and shift course as you go. It's interesting you say that about TikTok uh, because TikTok is, at least for me, I um, was challenged by a client to go on TikTok this past summer. And then I've gone on there like almost an hour a day just to figure out what's the formula, what do you do? And I have found a very interesting intellectual side to TikTok where you have the professors talk and you can really delve into the topics. But at the same time, like I was trying to go on there with my business and you're right. uh, I just sound like everyone else. And that doesn't work, you know, uh, but it's interesting to see the young TikTokers, like these young uh, making so much money on. It's all fascinating. These, it's very fascinating. And, it, and I had this young kid that was going to help me. And, but I felt kind of annoyed because it's like, I know my communications and marketing, right? for clients and he's not been taught it at all. And I'm seeing things he's not doing correctly. And yet he's making it. It's very, very fast. Yep. I've not come to a decision on what that really means. <laughs> the other part of this too, is understanding like, if you're someone who's a strong writer, focus on things that actually play to your strengths. Like I, you know, I'll have a client who's a writer. It's like, Oh, I've been told I should do YouTube. I'm like, you don't want to do YouTube. You're a strong writer. So align those marketing tactics with where you can best use those strengths. Like if you're an amazing speaker, maybe you're going to work the conference circuit or have a podcast. You need to really be thoughtful about like, not just where, you know, what does my potential client consume, but actually where does that overlap with what's going to work for me? Because when people do unsustainable marketing things, like I have a friend who was like, I need to do 90 TikToks in 90 days. I'm like, I'm like, okay. Oh my gosh. I'm so you know what? I, I think I was on the celebrity entrepreneur drug. <laughs> I was on that and I was like, and thankfully my staff is kind of patient with me because we're trying to figure out different things. We're shifting. What I was doing was I was shifting clientele or trying to become more mainstream uh but it just hasn't worked and i just have to admit it it's just funny how you get so caught up in it like i get caught up in it i'm like oh my gosh i can't believe it you know it's just so and that's it's again we are all susceptible to this myself included i literally talk about coercive control and these scammy things all day long and every so often i'm like scrolling my phone i'm like huh interesting maybe i nope We are all vulnerable and there are some really great um, marketing studies about this, about 
how persuasive tactics, if anyone ever wants to dig into this, it's like, we are so vulnerable to persuasive tactics. And it's just, there's a reason it's called persuasion. We're hardwired to respond to these things. Yeah, it's incredible. So how did you, because you wrote that article, are you doing anything more on the celebrity entrepreneur or like what? Because you wrote that a couple of years ago, I think it was, but I just was so like you ignited yourself to write it. How was the response to that article? Oh, great. And I still refer to it constantly in my work. It's kind of a cornerstone piece that I come back to. Um, I, it's funny. I've read, reread it a few times lately and I'm like, oh, it still stands up. I don't need to update this. You don't. It's fantastic. Yeah. So it's just, I mean, it's a was piece. it a particular, was it a particular moment in time or you saw these bro people and then you're just like, how did you come up with it? It's just such a, I was piece. really tired of explaining to people. I was like, there was this, because of the bro marketers, there was this idea that it was going to be packaged and it was going to be a guy lying on a Lamborghini. And I'm like, no, her over there, she is doing shady shit. <laughs> And like really being able to point out to people. And I do have people like in my community now be like, oh yeah, that person, I see them for what they are. And I'm like, thank you. That was my point. I honestly, it was probably born like most things I do come from a place of frustration where I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to explain this anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to write it. I'm going to do a podcast episode or write an article on it. Oh, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, I, I was like, it just gave comfort to me that it's okay to make mistakes, but there is a name for it. Celebrity entrepreneurs. Yes. And what I say yes. in my book, you don't want to be a celebrity entrepreneur. I call it luxury famous. The luxury famous is that you're famous within the circle that you want to be, but you can walk down the street and be who you are every, everywhere else. Right. Isn't it? So we don't have yes. to be. And I feel like what's interesting for me on a personal level, like I want to be known for my craft I want to be known for being really, really good at what I do, but I don't ever want anyone to walk see me on the street. So I love that you put it together like that. Like, I don't want to ever, like the idea of being famous, famous. Oh no, no, no. I want to be able to go to the airport and have no one recognize me. That's the way I want to be. And what's interesting, the actual definition of fame is just to become known for what you do. We've exactly. mixed up the name with celebrity because fame comes, you know, is, 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 is earned. Fame is earned. Yes. You cannot get fame out of uh and i think it's so important for us to recognize that we all have gifts that we should be highlighted for right doesn't mean that you're gonna be people are gonna run down the streets after you so but we should be recognized and i really recognize what you did you really um that was a profound piece for me and i'm so Thank glad you. i found it uh what are you what are the things you're thinking about now Oh, I'm always thinking about what's wrong with online business and what's so next. I'd love to because what's, what's what's wrong now? What do you think with AI and oh, all? Oh, it's all wrong. Oh, oh, I don't want oh, AI. Oh, no, we have to do that. oh, AI. I feel like I've talked about AI all day today. Okay, you don't have to um, worry I'm, about it. I, you don't know, but I'm a writer, right? So I definitely have a firm eye on AI. Um, I think there's some interesting things in terms of how AI will impact online business because as a lot of these businesses have really pushed to like, you know, kind of map, you know, create them at scale to have like mass amounts of customers. The way AI is going to impact those things is I feel like with the quality of things are just going to, you know, drop and drop and drop, right. even like the, the content and programs I'm seeing things like use AI to write your course. And it's like, really, there's no subject matter expertise going in, then you're going to have a bot write a course and then sell it. Like we've got problems. And this is where for a small business owner, for an online business owner, focusing on personalization, individualization, really seeing your people. There are so many people that do not want to serve clients. They do not want to talk to humans. They want to sell their, their course that's garbage out of AI and, you know, thing. And I feel like AI is a really valuable tool when used properly, but it is going to be very misused. And I, people who do consulting work and hands-on creative work, they've got a really good, really good, reliable future because people want to work with people. They don't want to have to ask the bot for everything. 
Oh, I love that. People want to work with people. And it's interesting you say that because after my whole uh, four months of craziness with these celebrity entrepreneurs, I got myself an actual office <laughs> and to meet people. And, and I was like, oh my God, you know, COVID just took me on a different route where I forgot to meet regular people for coffee. And it's yes. so nice to have an office space where you, you're sharing, you're talking, you're having coffee. Yes. So, and I, that's where I, it, like, to that point is I encourage every business owner, even as a solo business owner or having a small team, you need to be connected. You need, you still need support so that you have a grip on reality so that you can like have a phone, a friend where you say, Hey, I'm thinking about buying this thing. And they're like, Oh no, 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 don't do that. We You're all need that right people. now. <laughs> yes. And I mean, I, Within my clients and communities, there is a thing called Maggie says no, and they'll just put in our Slack community. They'll be like, should I buy? And I don't, they don't even get it. I'm like, no, no. Maggie says so no. when they, yeah. So when they get a yes, they're very excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, you're right. How do you say no? And, and you need people around you to really take you uh, or help carry you forward. I, I think you're so right. Wow. Yeah. No, they are. But what else are you thinking about? So with an online business, right? Mm -hmm. Tactics are always, oh, that here goes that air part again. Yeah. Love us to fall out of my ear. With an online business, tactics are always shifting and changing. So yeah. my job as kind of an observer is to see like, what's next? Like earlier yeah. in the year, I observed something called mystery offers where someone's going to package God knows what up and be like, it's a thousand dollars. It's a surprise. I'm like, I don't want a surprise. And like, like there was no terms and conditions. It was very shady. And like, there's con the, the tide and the tactics are constantly moving. So I'm just always kind of sitting back and being like, Oh, that's interesting. Hadn't seen that one before. Like I've seen a lot of people in the last year, um, they co-op, they're like, I'm an ethical business. And I'm like, you are anything but ethical. Mm -hmm. So just really keeping a firm eye and kind of reporting back. That's kind of what I see my, uh, my job for the next little bit. Well, the no BS business, um, do you have like uh, information? It's almost like you have a nonprofit service around it. You're, you're really oh. servicing, you're really servicing people with what you've been writing. Uh, it's yeah. Been, so yeah. part of the mission of BS free business is accessibility and consumer education. So there is, you know, I do have two podcasts, there, you know, I want people to be well educated, well informed consumers. And like, yes, I do sell things. I'm not running a nonprofit. I need, I got a kid in college. I got to pay for <laughs> You got a kid in college. You look too young for that. Oh, I'm older than you think. <laughs> wow. I think the next, we don't get lost son in Canada. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to ask you what, well, how did you keep yourself so young? Wow. It's a I'm a skincare fanatic. That's what it is. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, but really, like, I want this information to be as accessible as possible to people. And that is one of our core values. And also, too, I have a recognition of the fact that in my early days, I did some things I'm not so proud of. So I also see this as a little bit of a repair for things I may not feel great about having done in my own business. And right. I feel like if anyone's listening to this and really looks at their own business practices and like, oh, I don't love that. You can always change it. You can always adapt. You can always evolve. Uh, and there is a lot of people in this industry, in this world that want to do business with people that are not doing things in a shady or scammy way. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you. And I'm, uh, it's wonderful that you're doing that. So you have two podcasts. Yes. So I duped the dark side of online business. And then I have the BS free service business show, which is for consultants and creative business owners. I love the names. It's so creative. That's fantastic. I am a writer. <laughs> yeah, you are a writer. Wow. Um, so where do you, where do you think um, the whole, because it seems to me that people need to be more real. So people are more in video right now. You're seeing shorts taking a, a dominate, position where do you think this is going to go like in the sense of video versus text it's interesting to me because 
there's a lot of people in my world that don't like video, that don't watch video. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Like they just don't have the appetite for it. And so we've seen the rise of, you know, short form video. Yeah. I don't think that's going away. I think we're going to see more and more and more of it, but from a marketing point of view, from as a business owner, I think it's really important that you don't overlook other formats. Like for me, I have ADHD. I have a very difficult time watching a YouTube video. That to me is torture. Give me a podcast and I'm good to go. So okay. really considering like, if you're going to create video, how could you use that audio or how can you provide a transcript or how can there be a written format, really understanding that there's multiple learning styles and like, how can you use those across, you know, different formats and really make things as accessible as possible. Okay. That sounds really, really interesting. So how did you get into marketing and communications? Well, I'm a writer from a very <laughs> Really? It's the one skill I could count on as, you know, so I had gone to university. I took a degree in politics. I thought I was going to be a journalist. I took uh, a degree in politics. So oh, that's so cool. And here we are. Here we are <laughs> in communications, yeah. which is not uncommon for politics. And what's funny is my kid is also in politics. I'm like, you aren't going to work in politics. So it's pretty funny. Uh, and then I just, I graduated. It was... There was an economic downturn when I graduated. So I decided to go back to school and to PR because I was like, what can I do with writing? And at that point I was like, I'm either going to become a personal trainer or I'm going to do something with writing. And thank goodness I decided writing because it's much more lucrative than personal training. So from there, I, you know, I worked in a PR agency, started my own business. And I've always been in marketing communications in some form throughout my career. So let me ask you this, because the one thing I think has been wrong in our industry is that we divide marketing and communications up into two categories. Like I used to work in politics and it's always been unified. And I think that's why a lot of the most successful agencies come from a political background and not from a corporate background. And what do you think now where are we going? Are we unifying ourselves more or because when I talk to some of these digital marketing people, they don't consider PR at all. And I think the best kind is to, is to merge the two. Yeah, I absolutely think there's a convergence. And what I see with my clients, we work mostly with tech clients, kind of mid market and they don't have the cycles to have a separate communications person. Right. They're, you know, they're, especially right now, I mean, teams are really stretched. And so they need people that understand both the comm side and the, mar- you know, the more digital marketing side of things. And that's why I feel like for me and my team, we've been able to be very adaptable because while we don't do PR, when you've acquired a company, I can help you message that and figure out how we're going to communicate that. How are you, you know, the internal comms elements, the, all these things that kind of fall to marketing that the marketers don't know how to do, we're able to really kind of fill that gap for them. So I definitely think those, those rules are converging more and more and more. Yeah. I, and that's what I see too. Wow. This is so exciting. I, I just feel like, um, I don't want to let you go, but we are at the end of the hour. And I just wanted to say thank you. Um, What is your origin? I always like to ask this to people because if you ask them where their origin is, you get a different answer than usual. Where, what is your origin? My origin. Yeah. Where are you from? Like, are you from Canada? Oh, I'm are Canadian. You from, you're Canadian all oh, the way. Am I really Canadian though? No yes. one in Canada is actually from Canada. I know. That's why uh, I'm asking it. <laughs> we, so, uh, DNA, our DNA tests tell me. <laughs> what does your DNA test tell you? It tells me we are very, very much from Scotland and Ireland. <laughs> oh, you've got the red hair. Yeah. So yeah, so that's yeah, fun. yeah. And there's a little like there's like a little like couple like a little Italian, a little Dutch, but it's like the white Anglos. We are we are such a white pasty people. <laughs> so let me ask you this, uh, and it's maybe because I just got off having done a huge dinner. And uh, I brought in Norwegian shrimp here to celebrate my office opening. Uh, What food uh, takes you back, gives you memories? So, you know, what's funny is being Canadian, we have very specific Canadian food. Oh, you do? Yeah, we have, you know, and they're they're kind of regional regional delicacies, if I will. But one one food that's very uh, popular where I live, it's called a butter tart. 
And that's something I used to make with my mom. And I just, so it's kind of, it's like a little, it's a tart. It's kind of like a runny pecan pie without the pecans. (laughs) But it is like, it is very, like there's a butter tart festival. Like we are fanatical about our butter tarts. So to me, butter tarts are just like, I see a homemade butter tart. I'm like, oh, it takes you home. home. Yep. It takes you home. Well, and then my last question is, when did you know you were famous? Am I though? Yeah, you are. <laughs> you became Actually, known. I, that there is, you are there is a moment... There's actually two moments. So I knew there my, were some moments. Yeah, no, there's two moments that made the, the first one's really funny. I, this is very early on in my career. One of my clients had been acquired and there was lots of like, it was a big deal in our community. There was lots of TV cameras there. And I ended up being on camera by act. I was like kind of trying to, you know, manage media and corral them. And you know how it is. Yeah. And I ended up being on camera and I had people in my small town stopping me being like, are you a millionaire now? I'm like, no, they're like, but I saw you on TV. I'm like, yeah, I was there doing communications. So that was the first time. The second time I was out with one of my most longest time, dearest friends, we're having a girl's weekend. And she posted a picture of me and another friend and her and someone she knows messaged her and says, you know, Maggie, I listened to her podcast. And it was like someone from her dance class. (laughs) How did that make you feel? I was like, well, that's weird. Isn't that weird? Yeah, it is fun at the same time. Yeah, I definitely have. I never want people to lose sight of the fact that I'm just a person doing my thing, right? So I always have this like little bit of awkwardness with that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, but you're making an impact. And I want to say thank you. You really, and I'm so honored that you came on, I was like, oh, I hope she says yes, because I I would just love to delve in. I think your message is so important. I really, I think you're helping people that feel lost, that really feel like they're being tricked all the time in this digital space, that there are honest people out there. And it's just taking what you do offline, online, one step at a time. And yeah, and be slow. What I love, sober second thought <laughs> yes if anyone takes anything with please slow down that's like my official t-shirt please slow down and send me your links so i can put them in the show notes so you can follow maggie because that is just that article i'm going to put that article up because that article really is profound i never thought of these celebrities as a cult but they really are they are a cult awesome. of personality and some of them can give you some wisdoms but be mindful Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time.